Hello, 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 my friends. Welcome to Write Hive 2024. This is the debate of traditional versus self-publishing. Which one will reign supreme? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, we're going to be a little bit more lighthearted there. We're not going to necessarily say one's better than the other. They're both absolutely valid, but we're going to talk a lot about the pros and cons of both. And we've got quite the panel to do that. Before I do introductions, and I'll have each of you introduce yourself, I must also say thank you, Write Hive, for putting this together. Write Hive is a nonprofit serving the writing community with free and inclusive resources, events, programming, connections, and more. The 2024 conference begins you this session, traditional versus self-publishing. If you want more content similar to this topic, you can check out A Week in the Life of a Traditional Published Author from 2022 Write Hive Conference or The Many Roads to Self-Publishing from 2021 Write Hive Conference. But again, today, all about traditional versus self. So I'm joined by Marv, Jessica, Ray, and Aaron. Thank you all four lovely ladies for being here. Uh, and let's do introductions. Can each of you talk a little bit about who you are, what you've kind of done in the bookish world, and whether you're sort of uh, more trad or self-pub today. Let's start with Marv, please. All right. Thank you for the intro. I felt like I was listening to the radio <laughs> or a proper <laughs> game show, actually, really well done. Um, Hi, I'm Marv, and I am a hybrid author, and so that means that I have books published um, independently as an indie publisher, and I have books um, published with, or that will be published um, in the traditional setting. Uh, I've been writing for a few years now. Um, I very much started writing from journals to poems to short stories, and um, eventually settled on writing thriller because I liked the mystery and the suspense of it. Um, and that's the book that you see up on my um, cover now, which is His Dark Reflection. And I released that in March uh, of last year. Uh, and the very quick pitch for that is, you know, it follows the story of a girl, of a family that's mourning the death of their son while their daughter um, seeks revenge on the parents that killed him. And so it's a very interesting family. <laughs> and uh, my traditional published work is uh, Fossbone of the Sun, and that will be published with uh, Penguin Michael Joseph next October, so October 2025. And that is an epic Yoruba inspired fa um, fantasy novel, um, or trilogy rather, and it just comes with politics and culture and magic um, and a bit of love, <laughs> sprinkle of romance. I say love like it's cozy. It's not cozy. It's like very dangerous kind of love. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, that is me. Wow. Well, dangerous love. There we go. Fun. That no, sounds very good. I'm excited to get your perspective. Jessica, can you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. Um, I'm Jessica Lewis and I write YA in middle grade. Uh, my middle grade is under the pen name Jazz Taylor, and uh, I represent the traditional side. Um, I am curious about self-publishing, so this will be good for me, too. Um, but right now, I'm strictly traditional. Uh, my books are, I write a variety of genres. So in YA, I have a romance coming out, a rom-com specifically. Uh, it's called Nav's Foolproof Guide to Falling in Love. And it's a, uh, I like to call wingman to lovers where Nav is trying to set a new girl up with her best friend, but then she falls for the new girl instead. So that comes out uh, March, 2025 next year. And then, um, but I also write horror. Um, my cover picture is monstrous, which is about a girl who uh, is sacrificed to a monster in the woods. And instead of killing her, it decides to work with her to um, get revenge on the town that tried to kill her. So that's really fun. Very different from my rom-com. <laughs> and um, my on the middle grade side, I write uh, uh, contemporary stories about cats. So there's just like a bunch of cat puns. <laughs> there's uh, Meow or Never is my first one. And then Starting from Scratch is the second one. And then Cool Cat is the third one. <laughs> so uh, very uh, eclectic career, but couldn't be happier. I love it. I love I, I love that the, the the real young books like that, they have those those puns really speaks to me as a dad, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's cute. <laughs> um, Ray, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. No, I am. Oh, OK, oh. thought you were muted for a second. Sorry. Go ahead. Am I you're quiet? Good. No, okay. you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> well, I am C. Ray Dart. I am self-published. With my own LLC publishing company, I write dark romantic comedies. Um, whoop, as my cover shows, um, this is my haunted romance trilogy, which are 
literal genre mashups. So I don't have different books with my haunt, with my horror and my romance. It is <laughs> dark romantic comedy. I also do fairy tale retellings with my Dreaming Princesses series for YA. And you can find my books on Amazon, of course, and also at brick and mortar stores like Barnes & Noble. Which is cool because it's not always the case for self pub. So that's something that we're going to yes. have to talk about a little bit. <laughs> Um, and Erin, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Erin Fulmer. I uh, do write in a variety of genres, but uh, my published series is uh, traditional urban fantasy with some paranormal romance, a um, little bit spicy uh, about essentially a, uh, a an attorney who is also a demon, half succubus, um, and her adventures uh, investigating murders and learning uh about relationships I guess <laughs> um so uh I was traditionally published I first uh was published in 2021 my uh first book came out um Cambion's Law um uh, and uh published the entire series uh with my previous press um books one through three uh and then uh in this January there was some uh, some nonsense occurred with my small press, and uh, long story short, I got my rights reverted to me um, upon asking some questions that they didn't want to answer, um, and uh, then uh, embarked upon a self-publishing journey in which I released all three books uh, kind of on a rapid release schedule since I had them all uh, pretty much ready to go, uh, but I had to go through choosing new covers because I couldn't bring my covers with me, uh, formatting, learning about the ins and outs of Amazon and KDP and Ingram and all of that. So it kind of had a unexpected, unplanned for crash course in self-publishing and all the work that goes into that. Um, so I guess I have a unique perspective on the two sides, although I will say that it was my uh, small press was kind of on the borderline between indie and uh, trad. It was that it was online or rather uh, digital only distribution. Uh, and also mm. uh, I think that a lot of the strategies that they employed for uh, sales and marketing was more geared towards the indie side. Uh, mm. So it was an interesting experience, um, but I'm happy to own my rights now. So. Yeah. Super cool. I love this panel. We've got, of course, Jessica, that's kind of deeply in the traditional world, but uh, so indie curious, right? We've got Ray, who's deeply in the self world, but I think maybe a little bit trad curious, at least. Uh, and Marv has some stuff that's previously uh, self pub, and now she's got a deal with penguin which is huge and awesome and she has patience to let them run their trad course uh and aaron has you know, that hybrid uh experience too it's really awesome whoever put this panel together which wasn't i wish i could claim but good job right hype team good job um okay so we're gonna start with uh like elevator pitches for both sides um and so ray's gonna talk about self-pub but let's start with marv i think and talk about trad pub a little bit what do you think is kind of the the main advantages, I think, the th things that trad really brings to the table that that makes it appealing. I mean, you could talk about some of the reasons why you chose to bring your latest work, trad. You know, um, I think the first thing is having someone supporting you and being that first wall between you and the publisher, and that's your agent. Um, mm -hmm. And we were talking just before the call started. It's also the hardest part of the industry getting an agent, but. A huge difference in my career is having an agent and having that champion and someone supporting me um, and someone being my advocate um, in an industry that would recognize that position as important um, as opposed to just, you know, a lowly writer begging for <laughs> for attention. Um, my agent then brings that level of authority where they kind of have to listen to what she says. Um, and of course, we just plan our little cool behind the scenes and then she takes that to them and say, this is what we want. Um, and so it really helps to, to have that person. Um, in terms of how the book production is actually done, um, like Erin said, it's it's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of work. There are lots of moving parts. I like that I can push some of that off to someone else. Um, I like that 
you know, brainstorming means it's not just me in my house forcing my husband to listen to everything I have, <laughs> I, you know, in my mind. Um, it means my editor and I can come together, my marketing or my publishing team and I can come together. Um, and I know that sometimes there is that either from experience or just hearing that it's harder to get your voice heard. I haven't yet had that experience. Um, I have had a team that have been really supportive and open to kind of taking on what, um, what I want for my book and my vision for it. Um, and I think it perhaps helps that I'm writing a book that comes from, um, that's inspired by my culture. So I get to pull that card very often and say that, hmm, this is how I think we would do it. <laughs> um, and so it just, for me, it helps to not be alone and it helps to have um, that push, whether it's in terms of publicity or marketing. Um, I, I do have a self-published book and, and that means that any day I don't do anything towards my self-published book, I earn nothing, like zero. Amazon's like your KDP counter is zero. Zero books, right? Zero, zero dollars, nothing. Um, but with traditional publishing, I can take it. I can say I'm burnt out and I'm not doing anything, but my books or my projects will still be on track. They'll still be earning money because there's a full team behind it. And for me, that's really um, what I take to be the biggest pro um, when it comes to traditional publishing, just having that support um, from draft to marketing to being, you know, even being in bookstores, um, you can get it into brick and mortar stores, but you have to do that a lot. And individually, you go there and you kind of beg for it. Um, but with traditional publishing, they have that reputation, I guess. Um, it's like you're going into this space um, that gives you an air of authority that ideally every author should have, but the world is unfair. <laughs> um, and it, it helps when you say that you have a publisher who has kind of vetted your work and has said it's good and then other people will believe it's good as opposed to you know being an indie pu publisher which very often I had to go and say I promise you it's good um <laughs> I think that is the the difference for me love it yeah makes sense yeah I, I love what you said too about having a team I think that is yeah so key so nice um Ray you give us our elevator pitch for self pub side. So if you write or if you don't write to market, you write genre mashups or something that's not necessarily popular right now. Um, self, -pub, self pub is your way. <laughs> also, if you don't want to spend years looking for an agent or a publishing company to pick you up, self pub is your way. <laughs> Also, if you want full control of your rights and your edits and your cover, self-pub is your way. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one of the key things, too. Like, a lot of the people that I've talked to that go self, the, the, the control is the thing that they are really happy about. And some people that turn around. Boy, I've talked to some writers that, like, are just cranking out books, and I'm like, how? <laughs> but... um. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got our elevator pitches. Um, I got a few questions here. Let's start with uh, what are some like misconceptions that people maybe have about your route? How about Jessica? Let me call on you. you you're the trad pub. What are some misconceptions that people might have about trad pub and how does your experience uh, compare with some of those misconceptions? Sure. Um, one that I see a lot, um, which is scary to me is that, um, there's a misconception that you have to pay uh, mm. for traditional publishing. I did not pay a dime. Um, pretty much the only thing that you have to have is some way to get the book to the agent. So like Google Docs is free. Um, I had word from school on my ancient laptop <laughs> that I did, you know, I had just salvaged. Um, so you just, that's like the only thing. And you have to have an email address. That's all you need to get started. Um, you don't have to pay for editors, even though they are great. I love editors, but you do not have to pay for them. Um, they are optional. And you don't have to pay for like um, character art if you don't want to. Um, you don't. You definitely do not have to pay the agent. And in fact, if they ask you to, they are predatory. You need to run away. <laughs> so you do not have to pay anything to get started in um, traditional. I see that a lot. So Everybody, just remember that the money flows to you. It does not flow away from you. Um, I also see that uh, agents are um, like inherently evil. <laughs> there's, 
they're they're often called gatekeepers or used very derogatorily. <laughs> and you know, not every agent is great. That's just a fact. It, in anything, not everyone is going to be the best. Um, and also, another thing is that intention doesn't really matter. So even if an agent has good intentions, that does not mean they're a good agent. But all agents are not evil. They just want to make money. So <laughs> it's kind of like um, having a lawyer. So you have to make a decision. Do I want a lawyer who's going to get me a good payout or do I want a lawyer who's going to be my friend? And neither one of those is a bad thing as long as they can do their job. Me and my agent are strictly business professional. Um, we do not text on the phone. We don't send each other memes at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> like we are business partners. Um, but I have a friend who her and her agent are tight. Like they meet up with each other. They have dinner together. They're like friends. Um, so it just depends on what route you want. But um, they're not evil. They're not gatekeepers. They have a pulse on what editors are buying. And so... Yeah, you know, like if you want to send in something like, like I made the mistake of sending a zombie book in uh, at the tail end of the Walking Dead craze. Like, it, it didn't matter how good my book was. They were like, I'm sorry, but nobody, everybody's sick of zombies. <laughs> like, nobody wants to read your zombie book in two years when it would come out. So it's, that's just part of it. And it's not personal. Like, we can't take it personally. Um, it is just business, which I think a lot of writers struggle with because that was hard for me separating um, my love, my soul that I put into this book. And then now it's a product to be sold. It's very difficult to make that switch. And so I, that's where I think a lot of feelings get hurt. I'm sure there's more misconceptions, but those are the big two. I like that. That's good. Um, but while we're talking about misconceptions about trad, one thing that I've heard like people very new to writing feel like, oh, if I get this trad deal, I don't have to worry about anything like like they think once they sell it it's totally hands off right and that i think is a misconception because i think that a, a, even a, a big publisher is going to expect you to of course be around for edits but then also if they're setting up a book tour you're going to have to show up for the book tour but but a lot of times sure. they may not be setting up a book tour so marv or jessica or aaron yeah any of you can you talk about kind of marketing experiences that you've had and what, what kind of misconceptions there are around marketing? Oh, I think we should all, because I think we're all going to have different answers. Right. Yeah. Well, you want to lead it off, Jessica? Okay. So um, I have three different publishers. Um, I have Penguin, okay. Random House, uh, HarperCollins, and Scholastic. Hashtag flex. <laughs> well, I just mean like, I see the difference because every single company is so different. Um, Scholastic, they basically told me, don't worry about it. Like, don't, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to market. Like, you're going to be in the book fair and it's going to sell. Like, that's it. Like, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. But then on the other side, uh, Penguin was like, you need to do a lot because you're not a quote unquote lead title. So you have to put your boots on the ground to get the word out. And we expect you to do more marketing. And then HarperCollins is a little in between. Um, they're, they definitely are doing more for me, but then it's not like Scholastic where I can just sit down and like take a nap. You know? <laughs> um, that book fair is like, wild like if you my numbers compared to the other ones that are like just regular like in a bookstore it's crazy the difference <laughs> um uh. but the royalties are you know it's it's money you know at the end of the day but like uh it's it's a different setup the book fair mm. market but my sheer numbers is crazy compared to what i get paid for the ya's um and it does kind of depend on right when you get the deal um because they'll you'll know. So if you get paid like, I don't, I don't know, like 10 K then for like a, at a big five, you kind of know that you're not going to be a lead title. If you get paid 300,000, you're a lead title and they're going to spend some money on you. So you kind of know from the beginning, what kind of marketing support you'll get. But, um, another factor is your editor. So I've also had this experience where me and my editor were really good friends. Um, we became like, we understood each other. We were on the same wavelength. She would say something. I was like, yes, yes, that's perfect. And I would say something. She'd be like, oh my God, yes. And so we were very close. 
And she fought for me for everything. So every time uh, my book could be pitched um, for to sell rights or to uh, further a marketing conversation, she fought the whole time. And my book performed better because we were close. Um, and then I had an editor who we were not close and we butted heads a lot. And that book did not do great. <laughs> so it it is like a, I, I guess it's kind of a con that it is a little bit of a popularity contest. Um, hmm. But if you, in general, if you remain professional and you're not like attacking people all the time, then generally speaking, you will be okay. Um, but there are like a little, there are little boosts and little detriments depending on your relationship with your team. So that's very important to cultivate if you can. Very interesting. So really brief. Uh, Scholastics, I think, are the only ones that do the, the book fair, right? Because it's used the Scholastic book fair, right? Yeah, they have like a, a chokehold on the market. <laughs> <laughs> chokehold, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've got schools on lock now. Yeah. All right. They do. They really do. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, that's really fascinating experiences. Very cool to hear about. Uh, Marv, you want to jump in with some of your experiences in marketing? Um, I'm at the really early stages. And so what I have more are like plans okay, okay. <laughs> than actual executions. Mm -hmm. So perhaps next year I'll report back and let you know if they actually executed those things. But um, because my, um, and this is crude to say, but because I had slightly higher advance in terms of it was a preempt. And so um, it's something that may be considered to be leadish, but again, we shall see <laughs> when <laughs> when reality actually starts. Um, but in terms of their plans and um, marketing and publicity, they kind of shared ideas that they have um, and it's great, but it's not a step back we like you have to do absolutely nothing kind mm -hmm. of either money or plan <laughs> um it's like any any bit you can do to help helps is how they would put it but i take that as just do everything that you can do um in truth i don't think that as an individual so i don't have like thousands and thousands of followers and stuff so i don't think that what i do on social media is enough to make a big enough difference compared to what an industry like Penguin will do or a company like right. Penguin will do in the industry. However, because of my self-publishing background, um, I'm kind of already wired to do a lot of these things. And so I do them. <laughs> and I think sometimes my editor does appreciate it. And I really agree with the editor thing. Like um, in the in the in the days when we got the offer and speaking to editors, She's in my editor was basically because I spoke to her and we had a connection and I could see that she was really passionate about it. And I was just like, this passion is not going to drop. Like you will keep this energy forever. <laughs> like, it's a threat. Um, and, mm -hmm. and because that's why I'm choosing you, because I'm seeing that you're going to really, you know, fight for me and fight for this book. And, and so I'm choosing you and not necessarily anything that you're offering, but knowing that I won't be like dead in the water kind of situation. Um, and, so again, with my self-publishing um, background, things like even though I'm just in edits, I my husband's an artist and so he's drawn my character art and I printed a few of those. They're really cheap, so they're like maybe 20 pounds or something to have a few. And when I go to events or things that um, um, I attend now, I give a few of those out. I started like a street team. This has nothing to do with my publisher. This is just me because I have this experience and I want to like have fun with it. And I know people are excited for it when I talk about it and it's still really far out. The things that they will do, I will push or fight and beg and everything to make sure that their plans actually become reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still in those really early stages. Um, but I definitely haven't kind of left it to just them, even though I, like I said, the reason I chose traditional publishing is because I want to be able to say this month I'm doing absolutely nothing, but then something is happening without me. So right. that's the thing. No worries. Uh, that's really cool. That's, that's awesome. Um, let me ask you too, and, and we'll get to Aaron and, and Ray, but both of you, I've talked with a, I have a booktube and I talk with different authors. One that I talked with is a woman named MJ Kuhn. And she's kind of had the experience with her first book where she felt like she needed to um, ask for permission to go do different marketing things with her trad pub author. And now she's more like, I'm going to beg for forgiveness with marketing things, right? So what, uh, 
Jessica, it seems like you've had kind of a lot of different experiences. What has been sort of your outlook on your own marketing efforts? Like where do, where do you uh, fit things in and choose to do things yourself versus whatever your publisher is planned? For me, it's uh, it's a little different, I think, than the norm because I have an anxiety disorder and that gets in the way of a lot. Um, my biggest trigger is new things. So <laughs> it's uh, pretty difficult <laughs> for me to market. But um, I, to me, I kind of agree with the idea that you should beg for forgiveness. Um, there are certain things in your contract that tell you you can't do, like you can't mm. post your entire book online before it's out. <laughs> like you can't do that. <laughs> um and that's in your contract like they, they're like you cannot do that <laughs> yeah um but if it's not in your contract you can pretty much do whatever like if you want to make character art you can um if you want to post little snippets um but only from the first couple of chapters that's in the contract sure. usually um you can do that it's like um they're not gonna be upset with you for doing their job for them <laughs> so yeah 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 they um they're not gonna care um but also i I forgot to say this earlier, but even like what, like it, I, this is a difference between self and traditional. Um, everything that you do in self, it can move the needle. But in traditional, you can post about your book every day for a year and a half and it you might sell 20 copies or you might sell 200. That still is not enough to them. Like that's, that's not enough copies. <laughs> so you should really only do what you have time for and you should do what makes you feel happy um so for me i did a pre-order campaign for the second book um and it really stressed me out so i don't think i'm gonna do that again <laughs> and also um a lot it was pretty successful but a lot of people were like i don't know if i like the book yet because it's not out so i don't know if i even want merch <laughs> so it's kind of a waste of money <laughs> Um, but I did it because it was fun. I commissioned art for the first time and I really like it. And so I printed them out on little cards and I sent them with people who pre-ordered. And um, I had certain people who said they really enjoyed it and they like it and they are appreciative. So to me, having, you know, 10 or 15 people say that they did really like it was was worth the effort. Um, but I don't think I will do it again because um, as I move into trying to, tackle more genres and and have more books I think I won't have enough time and um either way I don't think it will really matter um the only one who can really move the needle is the publisher and they have to want to do that so Man. it's a little yeah it's a little freeing in a way I guess because uh it, no matter what yeah. you do it, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things you're never so. going to sell more books than the book fair, right? No, <laughs> yeah. never. <laughs> you as right. an individual will never sell more books than a corporation. Like it just sure. won't happen. That's really interesting though. That like, so points for trad pub for, you know, with the scholastic, you like just, uh, yeah, you don't have to do anything. Cool. All right. I'll like sip my drink, you know, but uh, minus points for the, what you do feels like it's not going to matter. Like selling 200 is, uh, is not, impactful for them which totally makes sense i get it from like a giant publisher perspective but wow that is sort of a downer but all right so let me uh go to aaron now you have this perspective of working with a small press um mm -hmm. let me hear about kind of the marketing that you had with that small press and what that experience was like and and anything else you want to share with small press right now yeah absolutely so i was nodding along to a lot of what jessica was saying because uh I think the most important thing when thinking about the trad side is to remember that not all, uh, there's a cat here, sorry. Um, <laughs> Hello, <Kim>. Not all <laughs> uh, trad publishers or publishers that say they are trad are created equal. So just like Jessica was saying, each experience with each different publisher is very different. You cannot count on having one experience that has been described to you at the publisher that you're at you need to do more research essentially would be the the main advice um but as far as small presses they have less capital they have fewer resources they're not going to be able to sell books the way that a large publisher like penguin or random house or scholastic would be able to do um and so with my small press uh they 
did do some marketing, um, but it was very limited. And I found it pretty over underwhelming because there is a certain amount of overpromising that happened uh, from the beginning. Uh, probably not. It's And to be fair, I probably had an idea in my head about how things should go. And that was not. So my expectations may have been layered on to some answers that I got that were maybe what I wanted to hear rather than, you know, what was true. Um, so they, I, in leaving, I was able to get kind of their marketing plan and their numbers for what they spent. And they spent approximately $500 on marketing for each of my books. And it went down from first book, they spent more and they spent less than the third book than they did. So Upon seeing those numbers and my sales, which were self-publishing number sales, not trad publishing number sales, I still feel like I'm better off on the other side, but that would not necessarily be true if I had um, held out with that first book or put aside the urban fantasy that wasn't selling at that time. I think that urban fantasy is actually coming back now, which is kind of fun because I never managed to write to market. So I just have to count on time. Trends will come around again and eventually <laughs> somebody will discover my books is kind of where I'm at at this point. Um, so I jumped on an early offer for my first book in my series and my full series, essentially. I had a very good editor who I had a great relationship with, still love her, still am friends with her. Um, and right after I, so I, I got that deal without getting an agent even. I was a publisher direct deal, essentially. No advance, nothing like that. So very small publisher. Um, about two months after I signed that deal, I got my agent. So I have an agent now. I still an agent and still planning on selling some of my more traditional sci-fi that way. Um, so I kind of went about it all backwards and upside down, which is how I do everything in life. Um, just have to own it at this point. <laughs> kind of like the, I'm never going to write to market. This is just, uh, just the way it is. Um, so when I signed that first deal, I did not know anything. I was a newbie. Um, and if I knew what I know now, I would not have signed it. I would have waited. I would have written new books. I would have tried to go a more traditional path to traditional publishing. But with that said, there, the contrast to what my experience in self-publishing is, is that you truly can see that what you do matters. And I think that Ray mentioned this and Marv mentioned this too, in the smaller realm, everything I do moves the needle. And the downside of that is that when I take a month off, like I just did for my health, nothing's <laughs> so but then again if your publisher isn't doing that marketing isn't doing that work isn't supporting you then it's kind of trad and name only so it really I am an attorney so I have to say it depends <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on who you're working with what the who the publisher is you know, where you are on the list, if you're if you're a lead title, like Jessica said, yes, you're going to get tons of support. If you are a B-list author, you're going to get less support and you're going to have to do more. Um, and yeah. again, to what Jessica said, as to once you sign, or was that you? I don't remember who said it, but once you sign a book, you're set to go. Um, every book is different. So you could do fabulously with your first book and then your second book is going to go somewhere else or get, not sell. And then you're kind of back to square one, or you can, and a lot of authors who do very well now, you know, start out slow. Um, I'm thinking of some big names. Like I always think of like uh, Martha Wells, who's been writing fantasy for like 20 years and finally got big with the murder bot series just a few years ago. I think it's a few years, but it's probably like 10 because I'm old, but, um, but I did not know her at all. I ne had never heard her name before I read Murderbot. So those long careers inspire me as somebody who is um, hybrid now um, and who writes a lot of genres is you build, you have to build slowly because every book is a new adventure and could go, could take off or could just, you know, 
I don't think any book is ever like a flop flop because the standards for what is success is so different um, in every genre and every like level that you're at. Um, right. So for me, it's a success if I sell one book per day. That's a great month for me. 30 books in a month. Fabulous. at self-published. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. would be awful. That would be that would yeah, be that's... not uh, that would be a flop if you're a trad pub with penguin right right um so success is relative i guess and it truly depends on who you're working with and yeah um, where you fall and where that is right now has no bearing on your talent the value of your work any of that so one more thing i wanted to say um is that it is important to keep in mind and again this is already said so um just such such great commentary already, but this is a business, but we're in it for love from the start, right? So when you're taking something that you poured your heart into and worked on for years uh, and you bring it to a business to buy, what they value it at is not the actual value. But on the other hand, you can't expect them to have that passion for your work or to put the work into it that you did. I hate that that's true, but it is true. So <laughs> you will always be your biggest ally uh, and uh, champion in that sense. Um, so hold out for what you're worth um, Love and that. don't settle. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a uh, really good advice for everyone, important advice. And I like that you said, yeah, like, you know, success is relative and we can choose our success, you know, how we how we look at success. That's good. Because, um, yeah, I mean, if you wrote a book at all, you're beating a lot of people that dream of it, you know, which is great. Um, Ray, can you talk about, uh, you know, as an indie, your marketing team is everyone in that chair right now, right? Like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So what is um, that marketing like for you and like... Um, you know, how would you, what, what do you, uh, what's nice about being able to move the needle as I'm sure there's some things that you feel nice. And what are some things where you're like, I wish that it was different, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it would be nice to have a whole team doing things for me. I mean, <laughs> um, and I do actually have, so, you know, there are writing groups where people share ideas of like, oh, hey, can we critique each other on our stories? I also have a marketing group where we, a whole bunch of self-published authors and I get together once every couple of weeks. We talk about things that are working, things that are new, like somebody is working on Kickstarter. Some people are, you know, trying out the AI um, uh, narrations. And so we're able to bounce off of each other of what is working for some of us, what is um, you know, things that we're learning when some of us go to different conferences, we get together and we share, oh, what did you learn? How can we all work on this? And so it's actually very helpful um, to have a separate group where we don't share, we don't worry about the craft. We just talk about the business of writing because it is a business. And um, it sometimes it sucks. <laughs> Um, but it is also kind of helpful because we, we frequently just talk about like our roses and thorns. Of, hey, this is going great for me this week, or, oh, I can't figure this out. Like I had a lot of trouble with Ingram Sparks and one of the people in my group was able to, um, kind of help me. She gave me like a promotion code or whatever to help with the issues and, it's so if you are going self-published, try to find a group. I found mine through 50 books through 50 K, um, which is a, you know, social a Facebook group. Um, there are a lot of social media groups that can help, including right. Hi, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Free resources with lots of writers. We're all working on this together. And so we're all, you know, and we've all had different experiences so we can all help each other. And so, yeah. Right Hive is great. Social media groups, um, like 50 books to, or 20 books to 50K, that's what it is. And Wide for the Win, if you are wanting to go outside of Amazon, um, that's another really great resource for uh, wide 
publishers or um, self-published people of when you're not just exclusive to Amazon. Um, also, uh, Brian Conan, I think his, his last name, first name is Brian. He does a free webinar um, every few months on social or on Facebook to help people with Amazon ads. And so that is a huge thing of like, yeah, I have to make my own Amazon ads. I have to make my own social media ads. And it's not quite as easy as we would like it to be necessarily. And it is constantly changing on what is acceptable, what is um what is the right way right way to do things. And so it's I do have to, you know, kind of stay on top of things to say, oh, okay, this is the new things that they're changing. And okay, Goodreads, if I want to do an ad, I have to do it during, or it's best to do it during this month when they have a sale. <laughs> and so for their, their ads. And so it is a lot of, you know, me doing things. And so I do set aside a day of every week to or in a couple hours to work specifically on marketing. Um, and like also part of that is, you know, submitting to conferences to go to be able to present or to be able to um, participate in because this is a, a way of marketing, of getting my face out there, see my books. <laughs> and and I, I love conferences. I love conventions. I love going to book fairs and books. Well, okay, yeah, in person book markets and book signings. I know that's not for everyone. And that is very much a, a thing for anyone who is marketing at any, you know, you figure out what is what you are good at and what you are comfortable with. And you just hone in on that. Don't try to do everything because if you do, you won't do well with all of the things. So it is very much a, Figure out where your target audience is. Figure out how mm. you can personally reach them the best and zone in on that because if you try to do everything, yeah, it's not going to work. So, and if you try to do something that you don't like, like I don't like to do videos, being even on this, I'm just like, mm, yeah, oh. <laughs> And so I I can't do the book talk. I can't do TikTok because I don't I'm not a video editor. I don't know that stuff. But I can I can make crazy fun little pictures on Instagram and I can find or do little things on Facebook. And so and that is where a lot of my target audience is of just nice. people. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. Really cool. Um can you talk, well, and, and let me say briefly, thank you for being here, even if you're you know, not the most uh, fun thing for you. I appreciate it. Um, um, distribution is one thing that generally trad has over indie. Generally speaking, indies are not going to be in bookstores, but you, Ray, are. So can you just like briefly, briefly talk about like, what did it take to do that? <laughs> yeah, I briefly <laughs> i know i know like it's a can of worms but yeah i have an entire presentation in the works on this because oh, okay. it is it is a process um i work at a bookstore actually way it's a independently owned um bookstore but it is also through a main one of the top 10 largest distributors in the u.s and so um and in working at a bookstore frequently we get people coming in saying, hey, I wrote a book. Can you put it on your shelf? And it hurts that I have to say, I'm sorry. I ha I'm just a minimum waging peon. I have no influence on what books we have on our shelves. And so it's very, and bookstores require, or have a kind of quality check um, in order to get on the, you know, a lot of bookshelves, um, in brick and mortar stores you need to have books that kind of that look traditionally published that's what they want because if it looks professional then somebody who's just walking by they won't know the difference if it's self-published or traditionally published as long as it looks like a traditionally published book and so um like i if for a while i was just in my local bookstore where they if you you know, have a local bookstore that sells used books, 
they are much more likely to also support local authors. Oh, that's and so, yeah, um, they're, they're usually very friendly and just very, and also, yeah, call them first. Don't mm-hmm. just walk in, <laughs> you know, call them to ask if they actually, if they, um, if they buy books from authors, because otherwise you'll save a lot of, or you'll waste a lot of time and gas trying to go to all of these, even local stores to see if they might carry your book or not. Um, also mm-hmm. ask what their, um, their markup price is because um, it'll be different at different stores. Um, am- because when they buy books from Amazon, they get a 30% discount, which is not great. That's why they don't like to buy from Amazon and they much rather prefer to buy from Ingram Sparks, which suggests a 55% wholesale discount for them. And so that's why Bar- that's why Barnes and Noble and um, many other stores like Ingram Sparks because they get a much better discount. Um, you can actually email Barnes and Noble on their their website. They have a contact. Try to submit to them. They have a list of certain printers uh, that they will accept your books from. They do not accept from Amazon, but Ingram Sparks is one of the um, most popular ones, or like I guess they're most known printers that they accept from, which is why I went through them. Um, I did not have a great experience with. Ingram Sparks. It is a continual love-hate relationship. But <laughs> they get my books into Barnes and Noble, and um, and it's not just my local store. Even I thought that was how it would be. Like I, I do have to kind of um, like in order to make sure that my books were in my local book Barnes and Noble. I said, "Hey, I'm local. Can I do a signing with you?" And then they buy my books to mm-hmm. have at the signing. Make sure you give them at least four weeks notice, though, so that mm. they have time to buy your books <laughs> that makes and sense. ship your books. Yes. And then, um, but I had somebody contact me from Santa Clara, California, that's two states away from me to say, hey, I got your book. I really enjoyed it. Can I can I get the third book? <laughs> and so I don't I don't know how they heard about me or where they but it was they found my books in Barnes and Noble and it was fantastic. It's but awesome. um, yeah, yeah it's, I could keep I, going. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. I think every, every indie I've talked to, this says like basically they love what Ingram Sparks does, but they sort of really hate the, having to work with them. Like the process yeah. of setting it up is a pain in the butt, but yeah, getting that distribution <laughs> is nice. Um, Okay. I got two more questions that I'd love to get to, but I want to kind of, we're going to have to move a little quick here. Um, Number one, are there genres you feel work better with either trad or indie? Um, Jessica, we kind of mentioned this a little early before we started chatting. I think that you, you had opinions, so would love to hear your opinions. And I'm not sure if anyone else had really specific thoughts on this, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. so I think that if you write romance, um, indie is great, like really great for you um it's good for trad as well but romance is really kicking off in in this indie space um and i think romance readers are very voracious so even when Mm -hmm. they um when they read the traditional ones they're like okay now give me more i want more (laughs) and traditional is a little bit too slow because they um usually do like one book a year but a romance reader is just like i want it once every three months if you can so if you write fast and you write romance i think it's great for indie um on the flip side if you write ya or middle grade i think traditional is where you need to be because and it's really just a simple logistics question like your target audience doesn't have money so they can't go on amazon (laughs) and buy it and so and if you're a parent you go to a bookstore to buy children's books so if you write children's books typically um traditional is probably better for you those are the extent of my opinions (laughs) yeah that's good i I feel like also and i want to hear from aaron and Rhea her side but yeah, like the genre mashups that you kind of you do, I feel like that works a lot better on indie. But then also like really specific subgenres, like lit RPG or progression fantasy. I don't know if anyone's familiar. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. obviously, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, those seem to be popping off in the indie space, and I don't think the trad has caught up yet. You know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, really specific fantasy is great for indie. Right, uh, Aaron, you want to go ahead and jump in? 
Yeah, so uh, definitely romance, 100%. Um, and I think that uh, as far as uh, fantasy genres, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. If you are writing in uh, a smaller subgenre, mashups, something that is either has gone out of style or mm. is pending the trend. So a good example of this um, is uh, Travis Baltry, uh, who you know, published cozy fantasy, Legends, Legends, Legends and Lattes. Lattes. Yeah, he would as, feel like he spearheaded uh, the trend. There. I mean, this is like, this is the dream. Travis is living the dream as a self-published author and going, getting bought by, I think, Tor and getting, you know, new editions and everything. That's, that's not the, that is, do not make that your expectation, but take it as an inspiration because it does happen. Um, but so that book blew up on Twitter back when Twitter was the thing. Um, and as a result, we saw agents, big name, it's maybe not big, big name, but agents that I had seen in fantasy sci-fi for a long time got excited about it and started saying, I want cozy fantasy. Please send me more like this. And now it's a thing. So self-pub is the smaller niche areas in a way, but it can also kick off a trend. And you can look at self and see what's popular in self and maybe predict in some ways what's going to be coming down the line later because people are buying those. Um, I do think since I write both fantasy and science fiction, my fantasy, urban fantasy is definitely uh, a self-pub as is paranormal romance now. Um, but for science fiction, if you're writing traditional science fiction, I would say traditional is where it's at. It's a small market. It's very niche. It doesn't sell. As far as I, I've seen, it does not sell as well in the indie space because those readers are... I don't know if I would say they're more picky, but I think that they know who's publishing their books and they're going to those publishers. And it's true for me too. I have like, I get like the Tor and Macmillan emails and things like that because I am a sci-fi reader. And a lot of times that's how I find books. So I think it is very specific to genre, subgenre and trend. Um, but if you're kind of not in the... Uh, if you're not in the area that uh, Chad is really buying or focused on, then you're better off going indie in some respects, I think, or yeah. putting that book aside, writing something else, and then coming back to it when it comes back around, because it will. Sure, sure. Uh, Ray, you had uh, some thoughts on this too, genres? I mean, most of it is to repeat what you guys said of, yeah, romance is great in self-publishing and, and mashed genres or knit the kind of niche genres like because i i pitched my book don't date the haunted to agents for almost four years before i realized oh, okay this is not what they're looking for <laughs> because it's not just a romance it's not just a horror it's not just a comedy it it's all three of them very solidly and so it's and agents want something that can fit on a shelf that customers will go will pass by the shelf and know exactly what's on that shelf so they can pick anything and say i know i will like this um and they they know what to expect um on amazon though on um, any kind of any online distributor you can put your books in three different categories though so i have my books in um in you know, horror and in romance and in comedy, um, even though it's not on a specific shelf <laughs> because it's on all three. Um, so, well, and like, yeah, the the person who started the 20 books to 50K, he writes like soap opera, uh, space, um, military vampires, like <laughs> totally niche and totally specific. That is not to market, but people love it, and or so it is Some very people. yeah <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think it swears too much for me, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I never and, thought military vampires were a thing, but yes, okay. yes. So if you want to have fun and explore those weird off like what if genres, yeah, self publishing. But like if nice. you do, yeah, if it, but also if you can't, if you do these like specific sci-fi it's really just up to what you write and really what up to up to your specific 
Right. Um, so I want to ask one more thing kind of closing out and like, I almost wish I'd asked this earlier because I think this could be like a whole other topic too, particularly Marv with you and Aaron with you. Uh, you're both essentially hybrid authors now, right? And I've talked with a number of people that are interested in this hybrid uh situation right they're kind of getting the best of both worlds um so uh you know i guess can you talk about that a little bit and marv we mentioned just a little bit before we like record that you would be interested in in self-publishing stuff in the future um do you think that that is kind of a more broad future for for many writers that I, I kind of feel like this hybrid publishing could be more common than it is now. You know, I think that's that's going to happen in the future. Is that do you think so, too? What do you think, Marv? Um, yes, I think so. And I think so mostly because of social media. So um, ideally. Without ads and kind of the <laughs> traditional way of self-publishing, which is both words. But or the previous way of self-publishing where you had to learn how to do ads, which are really difficult. I never figured it out. Um, either Facebook ads or Amazon ads or kind of pouring money into something where it's giving you that kind of visibility as opposed to social media, which you're pouring in um, more time than money um, if you're not using the platform ads. But there is every chance that if you have a strong enough pitch, a good enough concept, and you can get that message across um, with or without showing your face, then you can get the kind of numbers that self-publishing, uh, that traditional publishing gets. Um, so if you remember from when um, there was the um, the lawsuit where they were trying, the big five was trying to become big three or something like that, um, and they released kind of some data on like the number of um, books that traditional publishing sells, um, you know, if you're not like lead titles or like the famous people and you're somewhere in the middle east you could be selling anything from 10 copies to like 100 copies to a thousand copies and tradition and self-publishing people blow that out of the water like in their first month or in the first year um in the 20k to 50 the 20 to 50k um 20, 20 bucks to 50k 20 yeah. bucks to 50k my gosh um the numbers I see there, people are earning millions. Um, they're selling thousands and thousands of copies. And this, you know, ranges from all the genres that you guys have talked about, but from romance to thriller and all of that. And I follow some really successful self-published um, authors on social media, on TikTok especially. I don't think any other platform sells books the way TikTok does because you have TikTok shop. Um, and for some pe reason, the people on TikTok will actually follow through and click the links and buy. Twitter would not buy. They would just like and retweet. Um, Instagram is not even going to see that you have something posted. Um, so TikTok is kind of makes the difference and allows you to make that push. And you was in the past six months, traditional publishing has bought a lot of books that have blown up on TikTok. And I think they're trying to hold on to that audience or replicate that kind of success, um, which I think is quite niche to, to self-publishing because people like them for that reason. They like that they have the author who is the publisher. They like knowing that you're supporting a person um, who is going to, you know, either start earning based of what it's like a direct you're not you're not selling to penguin who you don't know what they're doing with their money you, you know that this person has like two kids and like this publishing and you're supporting them but then it's also a really great story and so there's word of mouth you're stitching their videos you're sharing it and it's really good numbers like really really good numbers um and so for that reason i think self-publishing will always be viable to a lot of authors and something that i would you know, consider to do in the future again. Um, I had said then that the reason I'm not going to self-publish now is because I have a nine to five. But if I no longer have a nine to five, then I can self-publish because it takes so much time. Um, and I think with traditional publishing, you if you have a supportive team, you have a great time. However, nothing is your decision. Everything is a conversation or a compromise. You really have to meet people in the middle <laughs> for everything um, with the title of your book, the formatting of your book, the character art, the artist. Nothing is, oh, I have this idea. It's going to go in the book. No, it's going to be, I'm going to tell my agent. And if they like it, then I'm going to hope that they pitch it well to my editor. And if they like it, then they take it to the team. And then if they like it, <laughs> it, it kind of continues um, spiraling. Um, so in terms of control, um, the more authors are able that are able to learn 
understand and navigate social media, um, the more likely that self-publishing um, kind of niche will grow. And I do think that it's more of a predictor of what's to come, like cozy fantasy, um, even romanticy. Like, I feel like trad publishing is like, oh, what's blowing up in the indie world? Now we're going to swoop in and take it all. <laughs> um, because it's more ahead of the curve, I think, because it's riskier, you know, it's, uh, you're not really caring about a corporation person at the top liking your book you're really thinking directly what does my reader want to think and you're a reader and so it's like what do I want and someone will like it and then they'll tell other people and word of mouth is really underrated because it makes a huge difference like I know people who have quit their jobs just from starting um using TikTok in like 2020 or 2021 um, and they're earning what they were earning and more um, in their day jobs just from selling their books um, as indie publishers without using like Amazon ads and Facebook ads but having that space. Um, so it, I think it will continue to be viable and continue to grow. Wow. Very. Yeah. Well, I agree. Uh, Aaron, you want to add anything there kind of talking about yeah. hybrid? Yeah, yeah. I think that I agree. I think that hybrid is the way of the future for authors um, because um, it does allow you to kind of have it both have your cake and eat it too in a way, but also backlist sells. So if you are uh, self-published and then you write a book that gets picked up, Chad, that's going to sell your self-published books and vice versa. If you're publishing your own quirky romance books, people are going to buy your trad published books as well. Um, and I follow a couple authors who do it that way. Um, T, T. Kingfisher, I think, is one that I think of a lot. Uh, she publishes like fantasy romance that's quirky and does it her own way and then also publishes um, like uh, trad horror, I think. So especially if you're if you're straddling genres and you have a lot of different ways that you want to go, it's a really good uh, choice. Um, and also, um, I think that I think that the self publishing experience that I've even gotten under my belt in the last three months has taught me so much about the book business that I didn't know before. Um, so I think it's an advantage in that way as well. And it means that you're not as um, so I can't think of the right word. I don't want to say beholden or dependent. That's not exactly right. But even if what you do is dropping off in the trad world, if you've got if you've got that sub self publishing side of things going, um, it provides security. It provide you you don't have to wait for somebody to pick up your book. And then the third thing I think that I wanted to say is that. Self-publishing will not, I will not say that it is easy. It is not easy. However, it is accessible. It is possible to go on to KDP and publish your book within, you only need, I think that I bought uh, formatting software for like hundred bucks, 140. I use Atticus because I'm a PC user. Um, and it was fairly simple. I could learn it. I did not need any additional people. You know, I, I got some advice from folks and stuff, but like I was able to do everything that my small press was doing for me for the most part. Um, and so it really it it really kind of makes it accessible for all in a way that I think is putting pressure on traditional publishing, which is why they're looking to indie to say what's coming next, because we don't. We don't know necessarily because what's up and coming is already out there on the market and we have to catch up. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, publishing it traditionally is a, uh, it's kind of like a lot of way, it kind of lags behind a lot of culture. Everything is pretty set in its ways and we sell books one way and we look, we assess the market in certain ways, but things are changing faster than the industry is. And I think that that industry is now struggling to catch up. Um, Anyway, I could ramble on this for a long time, but there's also stuff like, you know, the monopolies that are happening with, we had big five, now we have big four, we might get big three, you know, it makes it, as that contracts, mm -hmm. it leaves more space for people to innovate. Sure. Um, I think but that it's exciting. It's un It feels unstable, but in some ways, there's a lot of room there to kind of explore and build something new in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's the one giant monopoly on the indie side, too. But 
Yeah, but but you know, the, nice that we can experiment. And some of that's changing. You see people actually like again in that like lit RPG space, people are posting on a website called Royal Road and then post it's serialized and then they post on Patreon, but then they bring it to Amazon eventually. The people some of the people doing that are making stacks of money. So, it's nice to see that there's improvements and and interesting to see this this hybrid model. I wish I'd brought this up earlier because I feel like we could spend the whole hour just talking about the hybrid idea, but but I think that I mean we've uh, we've been talking for a little bit more than an hour. We probably better wrap this thing up. So uh, this has been lovely. Let me go, Marv, Jessica, Aaron, Ray. Can you please tell everyone uh, where they can find and follow you online and maybe buy your books too? All right. Um, I am just Marv Rides on all social media platforms. Luckily enough, um, <laughs> because it can be quite hard to have the same. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I'm on Twitter, um, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I don't go to Facebook very often. I use it for birthdays and things like that. <laughs> um, but Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, you find me and Blue Sky, um, just my rights. And my book's coming out next year. And yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. <laughs> so We'll find you on all the socials with the same handle. Good job. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> like it. All right, Jessica, go ahead and tell us where we can find and follow you online. Um, I'm, I have a Twitter, but I'm not active, so don't go there, but, <laughs> um, I'm Jessica Lewis author on Instagram and threads. Um, and that's, you. that's probably where you can find me pretty much. Um, you can buy my books wherever books are sold. Um, you know, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, wherever. And, um, my, uh, romance will come out next year, March, 2025. Nice. Wonderful. Erin? Uh, Erin Fuller writes on Instagram, uh, TikTok, although I'm not there. Typically, uh, threads, Tumblr, and Facebook. Um, I do not have a Twitter. I filled it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and my books are available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. Uh, if you like uh, more uh, classic urban fantasy with a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, by Polly Furness in there. Uh, you should check out my series. Uh, the full series is available um, currently uh, complete unless I decide to write more books, which might happen now that I own them. <laughs> so nice, we'll see what happens. Nice, nice. I um, I do have a day job, so my writing time has been uh, limited, but uh, yeah, always appreciate every single reader who uh, makes time for my books. So yes. thank you. Absolutely. It also just uh, tickles my heart in a, in a just terrible way that nobody calls it x.com. But anyway, uh, Ray, please, where can everyone find and follow you online? Um, you can find me on Facebook, just with Facebook, c.ray.dark. And I'm also on Instagram with just c.ray.dark. Um, I have my website, c.ray.dark.com, or also nursingboxpublishing.com. Um, they'll lead you to the same place. You can find my books on Amazon. They are available on Kindle Unlimited. And then also, of course, on uh, Barnes and Noble. And pretty much I've even heard people say that they're in Walmart. So <laughs> anywhere books are sold. <laughs> Lovely. Cool. Uh, and I'm on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Nicholas W. Fuller. I do some interviews with authors. Uh, you can also check out my newsletter on Patreon. It's free, patreon.com slash Nicholas W. Fuller. Or my website, which you guessed it, nicholaswfuller.com. Uh, thanks for your time, ladies. This has been a really interesting conversation. Um, thank you, Right High, for putting this on and letting me be a moderator and learn some things talking to these lovely ladies. And thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Right Hive. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>